Hi everyone. I'm going to talk about Coursera's adoption of Cassandra. Um, so to start off, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Daniel. I work at Coursera as a software engineer on the infrastructure team, and I mainly build core services as well as data access layers, and we also take care of the databases and service architecture of Coursera. Um, so what I'll be covering today is, um, I'll do a brief introduction of what Coursera does, just so that you understand what our data needs and use cases are. Next, I'll explain what exactly do we want from the database. Uh, and then after that, I'll explain why MySQL started to be a little bit limiting for us. And after that, I'll tell you about why we picked Cassandra and what has our experience been like so far in the last two years. So Coursera is a company that aims to provide universal access to the world's best education. And we do this through a combination of lectures, quizzes, discussions, programming assignments, and peer review. And we're available on web, iOS, and Android. So we are triple platform um, web service. And what we want from our database is the following features. First is we want consistently fast latencies from our database tier. And the reason is on any single page to provide a full and rich learning experience, we actually need to do many, many queries. So for example, on this page where we are showing the lecture video, there are actually many components that need to be retrieved before we can successfully serve this page to the user. For example, on the upper left hand side, you can see we have the structure of the course that says this is week one and this is the lecture name and we need to retrieve basically information about the course. And then to show the actual lecture video, we need to make another metadata call to figure out where is this lecture for this um, where is the, sorry, where is the video file for this lecture? Where is it stored? Which CDN to use? And then just below, there's the start of the discussions tab, so we need to retrieve discussions relevant to this particular lecture item. And in the upper hand side, this is actually the user's overall progress in the course, and this consists of many different items that are then aggregated together in a different query. So even on just a simple looking page like this, we've made at least like five or six separate subcomponent calls. And if any of these components start to slow down, that can start to affect the user experience because the page will load slower. And so having a database where we can get consistently fast queries is actually very crucial to us to achieve a good user experience. The second thing we care about is availability. So for a company of our size of about 200, engineer, uh, 200 uh, employees, it turns out that we actually have a pretty high proportion of users that are not from the US. In fact, over 70% of our users that use the site actively every month are outside the US. And as such, there isn't really a good time where we have like, a blackout period where we can just say, like, OK, we're going to go down for like an hour to do upgrades. Like any other internet company, we are basically a 24-7 type web service. So Cassandra or any database that we use ideally will be able to give us the flexibility to do operations do migrations, all without taking downtime. Thirdly, we care about scalability. As time goes on, we acquire more users, we acquire more content, we enrich the site with more features, such as tracking your learning, tracking discussions, letting people upvote discussions, and all these things have a tangible co cost in terms of database performance, and so we want a database that can scale with our usage. And ideally, we will have a database that can scale horizontally so that the interior will not be any physical limit to how much data and capacity we can use. Other niceties from a database that would be great would be operational ease. We have a very small team of infrastructure engineers that manage the operation of the database. And we have many other responsibilities to do as typical in a startup. And as such, the easier to run the database, the better. Um, and eventually, it will be great if you can have a database that will work across multiple data centers, just so that we both have a disaster recovery plan if the data center we're in goes down for an extended period of time. Or in future, if we decide that we want to give even better API performance to our users in Asia or in Europe by putting, that, putting the data closer to them. 
So to switch gears a little, let me just tell you roughly what Coursera's tech stack looks like. So we are 100% on AWS. Uh, we use a mix of MySQL and Cassandra, although increasingly more of our new features are built on Cassandra. And we are a service-oriented architecture. So in the earlier days where we were mostly in MySQL shop, some of the challenges we faced is that in school and in a lot of places, you will learn that MySQL is the place to use a normalized data model. And that the promise is that as long as you store your data in a normalized fashion, you can write the query that you need to get the answer out of your database. So for example, as long as I beforehand put my data in the correct tables of users and courses and enrollments, I can then write any query I want to answer any question I have, um, which, in, which is true. But the problem is because of the multiple joins and filterings and all this work that the database has to do, it's very hard to predict what your query performance will be like. And it's very easy to end up with a query that's very bad or has performance that fluctuates depending on what the database is doing and the pattern of data you have on this. So increasingly, this became a problem because someone would deploy a piece of code that has a really bad query in it. And you accidentally start calling it a lot, and the database will go down, and we'll spend a lot of time figuring out why is this query bad, and how can we fix it. So that's not quite ideal. Um, but that's not the only problem. Um, there are two ways to scale MySQL. One is you keep getting a bigger box. And then eventually, your box is so big, there's no bigger box. And then you need to start sharding. And once you start sharding, you actually lose a lot of the benefits of using a relational database. Because you can't do joins across shards. You can't do filtering across shards. And you have to have all this application code to manage the shards. And this is not something that we wanted to invest in a lot in. Because like I said, we have a small operations team. And also, if we needed to reshard in future or do all this kind of repartitioning, this is something that other databases can do transparently, but not a SQL-like database. And the last limitation is that because SQL databases are single master. Um, every time you have to do a failover, it involves taking downtime. And that usually fluctuates between one to five minutes, depending on whether your database is um, set up across different data centers and things like that. Um, so it's not very ideal as you run more machines, because every time you have to do an upgrade or to do a table change, you might result in downtime. So eventually, we decided that we wanted to try Cassandra. So Cassandra's columnar model appealed to us because it was pretty flexible. Uh, in particular, its tunable consistency was a very good feature for us. A lot of NoSQL stores don't have a very good story around consistency. For example, some of them are just eventually consistent, and you cannot control uh, what kind of consistency you're getting. Um, this is a little bit problematic for some of our use cases. Because as an educational company, we accept people's homework submissions effectively. And I'm not sure if you've ever had your homework lost before, but people get really angry when you lose that submission. So having the choice to be consistent or not is actually very important for us. Uh, Cassandra is fast. And as I mentioned earlier, having a consistent performance is very critical for us. And it's horizontally scalable. And the last thing to not overlook is that Cassandra has a good community. Uh, like any database, at some point, you're going to run into this weird edge case situation. And with MySQL, if you Google online, you'll probably find a solution to it. And the same thing probably holds true for Cassandra, which is great. Because otherwise, you might have to start reading the code and digging deep into internals. And that's not really a situation you want to find yourself in very often. So we've been using Cassandra in production for about two years now. And these are some of the reflections that I had after pushing forward our migration towards Cassandra and using it in production. So some of the initial pain points we faced is that Cassandra doesn't let you execute arbitrary queries. Um, in MySQL, you can filter, you can sort. Even if you don't have an index on the column, SQL will happily do a full table scan for you to get back all your data. Um, not that I recommend doing this for production use cases, but it turns out this is pretty useful, say, when you need to do a batch job every night, and you just want to look over most of the data. Or if you have a read replica and your engineers want to just sanity check the data. Or you realize that 
hey, I forgot about this particular use case and I want to go add it in right now. Um, the ability to execute queries, any query you want, is actually very useful and productive. And from that sense, people felt like they were missing out a little on things. And it was actually quite a bit of a mindset shift to give up this flexibility to be able to ask any question of your database. Um, the second thing is that Cassandra, unlike MySQL, cannot be abused as an OLAP database. So in MySQL, you have the full power of SQL, basically. So you can do things like counts and aggregations and calculate percentiles. Um, but in my Cassandra, you basically are restricted to reading a partition. You could scan over the whole database, or you can read a partition. There isn't really a middle ground where you can ask the database to aggregate things for you. It's changing a little bit with user-defined functions, but at the heart, Cassandra is designed to be an OLTP database. So it's designed to touch very, very few roles at one time. And so not being able to use it as an OLAP database can be a little bit problematic if your company is smaller and your data is in a medium-sized scale where you could probably get away with using MySQL as an OLAP database for some of your dashboards and queries. Because in Cassandra, you no longer have this option and you have to resort to other means, like Spark or loading it into a different database, for example. So this was a little bit of a, a mindset shift for people, too. Um, and the last one is developers were worried about this term, eventual consistency. Um, to quote someone else, people often confuse eventual consistency with hopeful consistency, um, where hopeful means that at some point, my data may or may not show up. Um, Cassandra is much better than that. When they, eventual means that the data will get there. It's just that it might take a little bit of time, depending on if there are node failures and weird network scenarios like that. Um, but in most cases, if you're reading from Quorum, writing from Quorum, unless you have machine failures or weird network partitions, you're going to get back the latest data. So this really isn't a problem. It's more about educating people that this is not what you think it is and getting them to understand and be comfortable with that. Um, so this is something that I've been alluding to in the previous slide. But basically, Cassandra is a NoSQL database. But a lot of people are used to using a SQL database. And they're inherently different from the top to the bottom. So you need to start designing your application differently. You need to model your data differently. And even the way you do your queries and some of the use cases will be handled differently. And so for a lot of people who are used to using SQL, this requires a pretty big mindset shift because they no longer can use the patterns that they're used to and have become accustomed to or have learned in school. So in particular, what was very helpful for us is we had a core group of people who had very good Cassandra expertise, not just on the operations side, but also on how to model your data. Uh, in particular, we knew how certain data models might affect performance on the cluster, as well as how certain data models are considered anti-patterns. For example, it's really easy to end up creating a data model that resembles a queue, which is an explicit anti-pattern in Cassandra. And the problem doesn't show up immediately in development. But once you start running it in production, you start running into operational issues, such as compaction problems and tombstones. So it's really important to get the data model right for Cassandra and more so than in SQL, because the data model will affect your performance, and it will also affect what queries you can do, which leads to my last point in which, unlike SQL, where the promise is once you put in the data, you can get the data back out in any way, shape, or form you want using some really long SQL query if necessary, in Cassandra, you really need to know the queries you want to ask of your data beforehand. Uh, and this is really one of the biggest issues that people have when transitioning from SQL to NoSQL, and that is they're not used to thinking about all the queries they want to know of their data beforehand. So you really need to sit them down and think about the application requirements and figure out what are queries you want to ask and then think about the data model for your application that will allow you to do these queries. Without, doing, without knowing the queries, it's not possible to design the data model for Cassandra effectively. So this is pretty much like the most important thing when transitioning to Cassandra, which is you need to know your queries first so that you can determine the appropriate data model for your application. 
Um, and the last part is, there is a lot of benefit in knowing very intricate details about Cassandra, such as compaction, re read repair, normal repair, and how the data model is laid out on this and how that affects performance, because this knowledge will enable you to advise people the best. And I'll just leave you with a little quote, which is that, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb, climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Uh, in essence, a lot of people mistake Cassandra as a drop-in replacement for SQL, and they try and apply a relational data model and just translate it into Cassandra. And you see a question like this pop up every now and then on the mailing list. And this is a really bad idea, because you're basically treating Cassandra as MySQL, which will not work. You need to fundamentally change how you work with the database in order to maximize its potential. Um, so to help illustrate this point, I'll walk you through a simple example of enrolling learners into a course. So on Coursera, we have learners and we have courses. And we need to keep track of which courses a particular learner has enrolled in. So if you think about it, learners have a many-to-many -many relation with courses. And we need to keep track of this membership. So in the SQL world, you'll have a table that looks like this. You, know, you create a table with an ID, a course ID, a learner ID. And you index the learner and course ID so that you're able to efficiently check this membership. So this schema, if you translate it directly to Cassandra, there are actually quite a few problems with it. So the first problem is the ID field is an auto-increment field, which is a very convenient feature in SQL. But such a thing doesn't exist in Cassandra. And the reason is, in a distributed system, it's very hard to have a consistently incrementing integer because you would then need to coordinate among all the nodes to be able to create this sequence. So an easy fix for this is to just use a time UUID, which is a unique ID generated by a combination of methods. And you can use this effectively to replace your primary key. The second problem is that we are enforcing a unique constraint on the member fields course ID and learner ID. And similarly, in a distributed system, it's not possible to say that this particular fields within a row are unique across the whole system, because that will require nodes to talk to each other, which is not what you want to be doing. The last thing is that in SQL, you often model things as foreign keys, which helps to impose constraints on your relationships. So in this case, we say that course ID needs to be a foreign key to the course table, and the learner ID needs to be a foreign key to the user's table, which is good because it protects your data based from bad data. But in Cassandra, there's no such thing as a foreign key. And that's partly intentional, again, going back to the fact that it's a distributed system, and having to do these cross-relational checks are very expensive. And so you just need to get used to the fact that these constraints will not be enforced by the database, but should be enforced by your application if you really care about your data being correct. In a lot of cases, it doesn't matter if you have a dangling object right, that was created and then forgotten about. Uh, for most cases, it doesn't really matter. And in the analysis side, you can just filter them out. So here's what the same table would look like in Cassandra. So we've gotten rid of the primary key ID. And instead, we've decided to use a compound key that represents this relationship. So here, the partition key is the learner ID. And we've made the clustering key the course ID. And both of them are UUIDs, which are generated on the application server side or using a SQL function. But they're basically unique at that point in time. And we use them to represent this entity. This table allows us to fulfill both the query, is this learner enrolled in this course? because we can just look up the row by its entire primary key. But it also has a nice side effect that we often like to show people a dashboard of all the courses they're enrolled in. And we can just fill in the partition key, which is the learner ID. And Cassandra will return us all the rows with the different course IDs. And using this, we can list out all the courses a particular learner is enrolled in. The interesting thing is one of the queries that this table cannot answer is, for a particular course, tell me all the learners that are enrolled in it. Right? Which is why I said it's very important to know your query beforehand. Because if you didn't think of it, you're going to be missing a table that you then will have to fill up later on in your application lifecycle. 
lastly, some of the things that we found very helpful in our move to Cassandra is having a team that's part-time job is to consult with people on trickier use cases of Cassandra is very helpful because then we can unblock the application developer from having to know everything about Cassandra before they start working on their code. And it also makes sure on the operation side that people are not writing data models that are inherently crazy and bad for the system. So our usual advice to people is, here are a certain set of patterns that are well known, but if you need to deviate from them, come talk to us and we'll be happy to sit down with you for an hour to figure out what's right in your use case. Otherwise, people might do things like create a wide role with one million objects, and that would be terrible. Um, the second thing is monitoring. So we have very detailed monitoring down to the table level in our system dashboard. And this lets us see which particular use cases are not performing as expected. And then we can go work with the application teams to remediate their data model or their query pattern, or maybe add some caching, whatever it is, to make sure that the system is healthy again. And in, it saved us a lot of times because we were at the brink of failing over, and because we caught something like a bad batch job running at 1 million QPS or something like that, we can quickly ask them to shut it down before the site is badly affected. Um, and the last thing that we've been doing and pushing forward with is, for a lot of simple use cases, you don't actually care what database you're using. All you really care is the pattern of the data that you're storing. For example, a lot of cases can be handled with a simple key value store. So we have a library that lets people use Cassandra as a key value store, and we handle the serialization and deserialization. And using this, we can do all the best practices, like using prepared statements in CQL, setting the right consistency level. And the application developer doesn't have to care about all of this. All they need to do is to just use our library. Uh, for more complicated things like storing inverted indexes or denormalized tables, uh, we're also experimenting with having a service that is basically what we call a data access tier, where you declare, this is my data model. These are the fields that I want to denormalize. Please do it for me when I give you the data. Uh, so as the infrastructure team, we can handle all the nitty gritty Cassandra details, and the application developers are free to do their job and write, think about the correct data model for the application, and we'll take care of the Cassandra side. So the indexing, the querying, setting all the correct parameters, um, and so far, it's working out pretty well for us. It allows people to work faster without having to learn how should I do denormalization in Cassandra, what are Cassandra batches, what's the difference between a logged and unlocked batch. This is all taken care of by our service. <clears throat> so to recap, some of the gotchas we faced in the last few years are having lots of truly ad hoc queries is really hard still. So for example, if you have a discussion forum that needs to sort by time or by vote count, and you need to filter out posts that are tagged with a certain tag, but not some other tag. Um, Cassandra is probably not the correct data store to use for this. Uh, in fact, like all this sorting and filtering is very hard to express natively in Cassandra. Like even if you denormalize your view, a forum view, for example, might have many sort orders and many ranking orders, and it would require many denormalizations to get correct on mutable fields, which is basically a nightmare. So for us, what we've done is for this particular use case, we've used Sola to do our forum discussion uh, data store. And in future, if we have more of these like really ad hoc queries, we need to think about you know, which is the right data store for it. Because in this case, Cassandra might be useful as a source of truth for the individual entities. But for all the sorting and filtering and ranking, you probably want to look at some other system. Um, and the last thing is, you don't want to use Cassandra to directly explore your data. So things that developers often have asked us is that, hey, I just want to check that you know, for transactions that happen in this state that the rows came out correct. Um, they come to me and I say, so is there a CQL statement that you can use to do this? And I'll be like, actually, no. So you need to have some sort of system in place to let them explore their data. And in our case, we have Redshift, which is Amazon's uh, massively parallel database for uh, like data warehousing. And we tell them to use that instead to explore their data. And we have a pipeline that loads data from Cassandra into EDW um, every night. Um, so that's all I had right now. Um, and so I'll take any questions that people might have. 
Yeah. Hey, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, how you compare Cassandra, when, when you select Cassandra, how, how you compare Cassandra with other database solutions like um, DynamoDB or HBase? Sure. So when we were looking to switch, we were basically deciding between doing sharded MySQL ourselves as our storage system. We also looked at HBase and DynamoDB. I think these were the three that we considered most seriously. Uh, we used MongoDB in the past before as a key value store, and that didn't go off very well. So we didn't want to look at that again. Um, so I'll, I'll go through these three like, very quickly. So the first one is um, HBase. HBase is actually quite difficult to set up correctly, especially in Amazon, because HBase requires HDFS. So you need to set up HDFS on Amazon, which doesn't work out very well because HDFS needs to know every single node's like, IP address. And because we have a very small ops team, we didn't want to be constantly fiddling with this list every time we lost a machine. Uh, you also need to have Zookeeper that's working correctly, also difficult. And then you need to install HBase itself. HBase also has a couple of other problems, which is it's not really a very highly available system because there are a lot of single master pieces in it. And so if you lose any one of them, your system might start going down. Um, and I think this is evidenced by the fact that Pinterest uses HBase for their, some of their storage needs. And their solution to high availability is to have a backup HBase cluster. And they have a dynamic router that routes between the clusters depending on whether the primary cluster is up. Um, so the fact that they picked that route kind of points to the fact that HBase is kind of hard to run in a like, always up manner. Um, so that's HBase. The next one was DynamoDB. Um, at the time when we were looking at it, which is two and a half years ago, DynamoDB had quite a few significant limitations. So at that time, I think you could not store documents that were bigger than 64 kilobytes, um, which is pretty generous. But we do have like a couple edge cases where the document is bigger than 64 kilobytes. Uh, and so we didn't want to tie ourselves into having this like, restriction. They've lifted it. But at that time, it didn't seem so suitable. Um, the second thing is, at the time, they only had local, re local secondary indexes with very strong restrictions on data size. Uh, they've since introduced global secondary indexes. So that's more in line with something like Cassandra's materialized views. So that's pretty nice. So I wouldn't say there's a big like, loss in using Dynamo. Like DynamoDB and Cassandra are relatively comparable in that point. Uh, in fact, DynamoBD might have a couple more features. Um, the last big thing to think about, depending on whether this affects you, is there is very big vendor lock-in using DynamoDB. Using DynamoDB basically guarantees that you can't leave Amazon at least unless you replace this entire data store, right? which is a little bit worrying, so depending on your company's take on such things. Um, and I think they now have DynamoDB local, which is this thing you can install on your laptop to use DynamoDB. Uh, in that time, they didn't have that, so it was also quite a big problem for us. Uh, and the last one was, um, so we have HBase, DynamoDB, and oh yeah, doing sharded MySQL ourselves was just like too much op work. The thought of like repartitioning the, the cluster when we had to, I just didn't want to do it at all. So those are the three main things we, that we looked at. Hi, uh, you showed a pretty basic example of a table schema earlier uh, mapping courses and user IDs. Mm -hmm. uh, did that show that you were then uh, doing some sort of client side joins to find the course information by the user ID, or did you also store that information in that table? Um, the course information? Yeah, so if you're looking up the courses by a certain user ID, mm -hmm. uh, w were you storing information about the course in that table as All well? Right, no. So the course information was stored in a separate table. Uh, and there are two big motivations for that is the course information often changes out of sync with your membership. So you might leave and go, but the course data is changed by the professors. And if you change the professor, if the professor changes the course, and we had denormalized the course into a membership, and every time the course data is changed, you have to go to every single membership and update it, which is a pretty painful thing to do. OK, so would you first then do a read and then go look up the other Right, um, and it kind of ties in with the fact that we are service-oriented, but we have a single service that serves all the learning material, including the course. 
So at the app chair, you actually wouldn't even go to the database for the course material. Right? There's a service that controls memberships and users, and there's another service that does all the learning material stuff. So the, the service on top that's doing both the membership lookup and the course lookup will go to separate services for these entities. Um, I would like to shed some light uh, upon the following case. Imagine that uh, we already created some uh, data structure mm -hmm. and it's already used in production. And we have huge amount of data, so it's really big data. And all of a sudden, uh, business requirements change. And for example, uh, we need to introduce new tables, new tables for additional views. And uh, of course, we need to copy data into do those additional tables. So we need to start some process of copying the data, which is distributed uh, across different nodes. Mm -hmm. So this process, uh, process is going to take a long time. And during that time, to the original data, to the source data we are copying from, going to happen a lot of changes, a lot of mm -hmm. data, a lot of uh, rows will be marked as deleted, modified, etc. How it's been resolved uh, in Cassandra? Right. So. This is a pretty common problem, and if you Google around, you'll find that the most common solution is, is a three-phase process to migrate to a new table. So the first step is, well, design a new table. And then in your application, start writing to both the old table and the new table, but still do your reads only from the old table. And the second step is to start a background process to copy over the old data to the new table. And here's where you can use a Cassandra trick which is why it's useful to know about Cassandra internals. So when you copy the data, you can see that, oh, this data was written at time x. And when you write the data into the new table, you can tell Cassandra, please use the right timestamp x instead of the current timestamp. And if you, for those not familiar, Cassandra's conflict resolution between two writes is that the write with the timestamp that's later will win. Right, so when I write into the new table, since I use the older timestamp, any future updates from the double writing process at the app tier will supersede the background copy, and so the new value will be reflected. Even deletes, because deletes are actually writes. Right? Imagine if I don't want to write anything in that new table until the initial copy is done. So, so how can I make sure that finally when copy is done, the data is consistent? Because while it was being copied, the, the data changes uh, uh, happened to the, uh, to the original tables from which data right, was copied right. from. So if you don't write to the new table before you start copying, then there's no way to make sure it's consistent, which is why the first step is always to start writing the new data first. Or Well, you can do both simultaneously, but there's always a period of time where you're writing to both tables, but you're reading from the old table. And then finally, when you're pretty sure that the new table has all the data you want, then you switch the reads to the new table, and you can drop the old table. Uh -huh. What kind of like what, what was the biggest problem you uh, encountered during migration? With the migration to to, 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 to Cassandra. Oh, I see. Um, I think there's the op side and then there's the developer side. So on the developer side, it's really the mind sh shift that I told you about. Right, people are like, I need to think about my queries first. I no longer can query my data any way I want. Um, the worries about eventual consistency and like a new way of structuring your data. Uh, I think that was the biggest hurdle that we are still working through even now because nobody learns about Cassandra in university or, or in any job training. Right? People always learn about MySQL, um, but nobody learns about Cassandra. So that was probably the biggest hurdle that we faced. And training and tooling and libraries and also that consulting team I told you about really helped with that. Um, and then on the upside, when we were using MySQL, we used Amazon's managed like RDS service. So you click a button, and then poof, you have a database. Uh, with Cassandra, we had to set it up ourselves and set up the ring and get them all to talk together. And so there was a little bit of a learning curve there. Uh, but that took like you know a couple of weeks of research and understanding to fully understand like how to run the cluster correctly. And then after that, it was pretty good, I think. How many, uh, how many column families you have, and are you using virtual nodes? How many, what do we have? How sir? many column families you have? Oh, I see. And, how, and are you using virtual nodes? Right. 
For column families, I think we have somewhere in the region between 50 to 100, um, probably closer to 50. I haven't counted recently. Um, you probably don't want to exceed 500 on one cluster. Um, but because we are not that big a deployment, we try and co-locate all our use cases as much as possible into one like, really powerful cluster. Uh, we're using the i2-2XLs on Amazon, and they're pretty big machines, but they're very good for latency. So cost-wise, it makes a lot of sense for us to co-locate it, which is why we have so many column families, because uh, the data models are different, right? Um, and then in terms of um, vNodes or not, so we are not using virtual nodes. Um, there are two reasons for that. So when we were on 1.2, there were a lot of problems with virtual nodes. I think that's better from 2.0 and 2.1 onwards. Uh, the second reason is we actually use the Netflix tool Priam, which is a code process, to manage our deployment. And so it assigns the token to our node. And with virtual nodes, you need to assign many tokens, and Priam's just not set up to do that. Um, the main reason we use Priam is it allows us to do things like, I set up an auto-scaling group to manage our Cassandra instances, and when we lose a node, it will self-replace, and I don't even have to wake up. So it's great. Uh, currently, you uh, use both uh, MySQL and Cassandra, uh, you said, right? Uh, yes, so can you right. give us a little bit more details on uh, what stays in MySQL, uh, what did you move in Cassandra, and how it co coexist? Right, so... And, and why? Right, okay, so the, the general philosophy is services own the data store they're using, right? So certain services might be using MySQL, certain services might be using Cassandra, and they're unified in the sense that all our services speak the same RPC language. So any of the mid-tiers that are interacting with each other basically just talk to the service at the RPC level. So they don't need to care if it's Cassandra or MySQL, right? Because it's all done through RPC and using the service-oriented architecture. Um, as for why we have both, well, we started out with MySQL. And for some of the core use cases, for example, the user model where we store people's login information and first name and last name, um, they were built on MySQL, and we have a good service on top of it that has caching and all that. And there's just no business value in migrating to Cassandra right now because it's working. Right? We have many other fish to fry. And so in that sense, we have, still have some MySQL because there are a couple of legacy services that were not built on Cassandra, and there's no real need to, to move them to Cassandra yet. Right? Um, for the new things where we want to use Cassandra as much as possible, then we try as much as possible to use Cassandra. If the data model really can't fit, for example, the filtering and sorting and all that kind of things I told you about, then we can consider like Sola, or if really need be, we can go back to MySQL, right? But because the service owns this database, we are free to change it out later on in time if we find that it's not working. What is the, what is the programming language for your apps? Uh, oh, right. Um, so our backend stack is written in Scala, which can interact with Java. So we have nice, like, uh, asynchronous programming, top to bottom against Cassandra. Yeah. Hey, so I have two questions. Uh, first is like, have you explored any uh, technical glitch in Cassandra in past one year of your usage? Sorry, could you repeat that? Have you explored any technical glitch in Cassandra uh, in your last one year of usage, like any bug which you have reported or something like that? So you, the technical... Any bug in Cassandra? Have you explored any bug in Cassandra? Oh, yeah, uh, a few. <laughs> uh, so, can you share details and how you diagnosed that bug? Right, so we are a data science enterprise customer, and that was pretty intentional because in our first year, we basically had no Cassandra expert in-house, and we wanted to have a, a avenue to like, ask people questions. So I'll share with you like, two bugs that we ran into. So the first one is I saw that the Cassandra heap kept going up and up and up as the weeks went on by. And then eventually the node will crash because it ran out of heap. Uh, but it was a very slow process. And when you force the full GC, the heap will actually drop again, which is really weird. And it turns out that in certain versions of the JDK we are using, it doesn't collect JMX classes. And so our monitoring system was creating all these classes that were not getting GC'd. And then the node would die. Uh, and if you add this magical flag, I think it's like collect all classes or something, it will like start working again. So there was one case where if we like had support and that really helped. And now if you search on the internet, you'll find like people talking about the same thing. The second bug we had is 
Um, we were using static columns maybe a little bit too eagerly in the life cycle of the introduction. And so it turns out that if you reverse the sort order and you have static columns, the static column will disappear. It wouldn't show up in the result. Um, and so we found a bug and we looked through the gyra and then we found the bug. And so we knew that it would be fixed in like two versions time or something, right? Um, so there are a few of like all these minor edge cases and um, usually either the mailing list or the gyra or for us like asking on support will be able to answer the question. And then in like very odd like eccentric edge cases like is um, replace token when bootstrapping is still allowed. I've also gone into the open source code and just looked at the code. Okay, so I have one more question. Uh, so uh, you said you are using both MySQL and Cassandra. Uh, so uh, have you encountered any case where uh, that data that, you, that is residing in MySQL and data that is residing in Cassandra, basically, uh, that's basically is, there a, is there an intersection in both of them, like in Cassandra and MySQL? Like services, those operate off of Cassandra need the same data that, serv pro that uh, services uh, that operate off of MySQL need. Is there any kind of intersection in your case? Um, yeah, as much as possible, we try not to, to duplicate the data. So we use the service to do it. Right. I think we're out of time. So thanks for attending, and enjoy the rest of the conference.